want. Good morning, guys. How was the party yesterday? Good? You enjoy Madrid? Yes. Okay. Are you awake? Yeah. Who had a cup of coffee in the morning? Raise your hand. Whoa, almost everybody. Perfect. Uh, no coffee drinkers? Coffee drinkers. If I could summarize it like that. <laughs> Okay, guys, so uh, let's begin. Yes, today we do have a session about passwords. First of all, let me introduce myself. What am I doing for a living? Where am I? Why am I standing in front of you? And why are we going to discuss passwords today? So, my name is Paula Januszkiewicz, and uh, I do everything that has something to do with security, which means penetration tests. I'm more on the good side, doing the bad things, which means that if you put me in your infrastructure, my job is to get inside. Some people call it hacking, I call it researching, so that uh, it has a little bit more positive impact. Uh, I do have access to a source code of Windows, which uh, makes me the person to answer my own questions. And uh, if you do have some questions as well related to why this thing is not working and so on, I'm happy to answer all of those questions after the session. So please stay, keep your questions, and I'm happy to, to help. A uh, couple of things more. What do I do, where do I work for, who do I work for, and so on. So uh, I'm based in a plane because I'm flying like crazy from one side to another, but at the same time, I got my own company. That company is called Secure, and uh, we are delivering trainings, penetration tests, so again, security, boring world. Uh, then, I'm also partnered with the company that is called iDesign, and that company is based in the US, in Salt Lake, and I'm playing the role of a security architect over there. So this is my background. I w was speaking on several TEDs uh, in a year, so maybe you've seen my presentations before. Uh, if yes, welcome again. Uh, if not, hopefully you're gonna enjoy the password session in the morning. Let me give you the background, what we're going to discuss, what we're going to talk about today. So, my goal for today and the lesson learned is going to be as follows. We need to be able to differentiate in between two password usages. So, whenever, for example, you authenticate yourself to some service, so this is one scenario, and the second scenario is whenever you give the password to somebody to authenticate whatever you are going to do for you. So this is the moment we are actually sharing password with somebody. And I would like to show you a couple of examples that you have in your like everyday world uh, whenever you are doing the administration so that whenever you put your password somewhere, we need to learn or at least understand where the password is stored, how is it stored, how is it managed, and if somebody can get inside your password and read your password. Is it in clear text or maybe it's like stored some, some in some different way? Couple of things, because our agenda, it's very simple. I usually keep it simple. Uh, first of all, we're gonna discuss the passwords idea. What are they about? What do we have? What do, what do we, what the session is going to be about? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to show you a couple of demos in which password is stored in another very expected way. Then we're going to discuss a couple of things that are relating with getting passwords from applications. So you use your password in some application and the question is where it can go, how it's protected, how it's stored. Can user get it? And this kind of scenarios. Then we're going to discuss all the situations in which password is stored in the operating system. How is it stored? Is it a password or is it a hash? Is it really a hash? Or maybe when you authenticate, it's only a hash. Somewhere else, it's a clear text password. So we need to be aware how, what is the functionality of passwords and how passwords are stored. And then we will do the summary. Because we are doing that session in the morning. If you do have a laptop in front of you because you are checking morning emails, stop it and download the tools. And be with me, okay? It's a morning session. We need to some, have some energy, yes? So go to the website and download the tools. To be sincere, because the internet uh, in the morning, it's relatively slow. I mean, Tech Head Network is very famous for that. I suggest so that you go to the second link and it looks like that. Download whatever. But, disclaimer. If you break your operating system using my tools, I'm not responsible for that, okay? 
So make sure that you don't run anything, but just run things with me and I'm going to explain you everything. If you have some questions about the tools afterwards, let me know. Tools is going to be available here for one month. So use them. Okay. And I'm pretty sure you will find them useful in your infrastructure. Um, tools are written, by the way, by our team, uh, the secure team. Not everything, but vast majority of the tools I'm showing over there. But you're free to use it. So I'm officially saying, free to use it. Okay, guys. And if you would like to check some following links before we start, here we go. Learning newspaper. Morning newspaper. Okay. So let's start the story. Let me kick off with one simple story. And this was something that was popular in the internet maybe some months ago. Let's read it. Let's have a small reading in the morning. You got the concept? <laughs> so, interesting thing is, is it good or bad? <laughs> it's good, exactly, it's actually very good. The interesting thing is that this password, whenever we are, for example, using this to authenticate to an operating system, it's actually considered to be a good password because it's long, yes? Whenever we are figuring out how long can be a password and how much time we need to spend to break it, we got the bunch of around 100 characters. Adding additional character will increase in 100 times the time that you need to spend to crack it. So it doesn't matter actually how long is the password. Another letter increases the hacking possibility in 100 times. So let's say that you've got a password that is to be cracked in one week. When you add one character more, it's going to be two years. Makes a difference, right? So this girl, I'm supposedly, uh, Now you know my attitude. <laughs> no, no. Okay, so this person, supposedly, uh, was actually figuring out a good way to do it. But what is not a good way she did, what is not the positive thing she did, she decided to share it. Can you believe that somebody hacked that password? Uh -uh, I don't think so. There is a chance that she, she said, oh, you know, I did that password. What do you think? Is it good or bad? So she shared it. So here comes the basic question. How often do we share passwords with the others? Very often. Very often. What is even worse? We do it every day. A couple of times a day. Let me bring you some statistics to the field and then I will explain you why. So a couple of statistics that I took from the internet. 90% of the user's passwords are supposed to be cracked in 2013. Well, you cannot assume that user is responsible for security, right? So they are like ABC123, hash, exclamation mark, whatever, yes? So this is the user's password. They're tending also to add some numbers at the end. And uh, to be sincere, I mean, once I was talking to administrator, who knows love track? Love crack, love crack. Okay, so I see like 20% of the room, maybe a little bit less. Loftrack is a tool that was, I mean, now it's just a tool, but when it was issued to the market, it was like a hit. Everybody wanted to use Loftrack because Loftrack is a tool that you can use to crack users' passwords. Against dictionary, maybe, for example, using the brute force, whatever. So whenever Loftrack was issued to the market, which were the times of NT40, so a long time ago, yes, you remember that, perfect. And uh, I was talking to the administrator, and this administrator was working in the consulting company. And it's a true story, and it's a, it's a kind of sad story, because he said, hey, you know, I did this password crack, and do you know what I've got? And the background for this is that this was a consulting company. Look around you, by the way. Do you see any woman? Who is sitting next to a woman? Put your hands up. One person, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. So consulting company, yes? In the reception desk, Kate. Kate. Everybody likes Kate. So what it appeared, that in vast majority of consultants, there was the word Kate somehow constructed in the passwords. This is the human vulnerability that we have. 
So let me bring you another statistic here. 70% of death passwords are reused. So if somebody gets it, what is the chance that the same password is going to be used somewhere else? If you store passwords in your head, it's a bad idea. Of course, it might be like a really, really long string. Of course, you might be a genius. But in general, it's a bad idea. You've got so many solutions like KeePass and some other solutions that are actually helping out to manage long passwords in a little bit more smarter way. We are sharing our passwords with all the social networking portals and so on. What is the chance that the password of some user won't be the same as to LinkedIn? And I'm putting LinkedIn with a simple reason. You hear all the comments about password was stolen, password leaked, thousands of passwords leaked, oh, oh, pay attention, mm -mm. Interesting. Do you know what users think about it? Do you know what I think about it? Why? Why? We are using such a miserable small thing, like a password. Why do passwords leak? Have you ever wondered about it? I mean, LinkedIn, uh, password leaked. Why passwords? Do they really, really store passwords in a clear text so that they leak? I would love to hear those messages like hashes leaked. Cool, at least that's some hard job to be done by somebody, yes? But when the password leaks, there's like, uh, something is wrong here. Okay, guys. So that brings us into a couple of conclusions. Every time we are using password somewhere, whatever we put it in, in whatever form, whatever you see, you put a password, you share it with somebody, always. The question is, how do we share it? And this is what this session is about. How do we share passwords with the others? Can we trust the party that we use to share the password with? Maybe we can. Maybe we can't. Or maybe we just don't know. Who, will, who of you will ever expect that the password is going to leak from LinkedIn and they're going to be in the clear text? Nobody. When you see this kind of LinkedIn logo and you've got like gazillions of millions of trillions of users, you're like, oh, security must be very good over there. Isn't it our assumption? Kind of, yeah, and here we go. So sometimes intentions, because the guys, I mean, I'm pretty sure that they didn't want it to happen. It's like, yeah, we're going to collect all these passwords in a clear text so that they leak one day. No, I don't think so. Yes? So let me give you some small demo. Fight a bit, a little bit Zilla. <laughs> so what do we have in here? We've got a simple Windows box. Yes? And uh, in that simple Windows box, this is Windows 8, doesn't really matter, I do have FileZilla. You know FileZilla? You know FileZilla? You know FileZilla? Yes, perfect. Be alive. <laughs> so, FileZilla. So, at that point, FTP, secure.tech, username, FTP. And then I need to specify the password, password, FT1. It's the simplest example ever. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do quick connect. Do you know what quick connect does? Saves the password. If you connect using FileZilla somewhere from the internet cafe or whatever, your password remains over there. Sorry. Quick connect, here we go. So we look, I'm not even sniffing big. We obviously, it's, ob it's obvious at that point that we're able to get it in a clear text. Okay, perfect. So what about FileZilla configuration file? So here we go, FileZilla. Let me open it in Notepad++. And uh, this is the story that we have in here. Why? I mean, quick connect? But quick connect option is just allowing us to quickly connect. Ah, which means we are storing the password somewhere so that we don't have to type it. This is what means quick. And we need to understand how application works. Of course it's Fazilla, of course it's simple. But at some point, you see, you see the difference. Okay, guys. So, I would like to show you one more thing. Let me take out my box. 
And uh, let me jump to this place over here. Pam pam. Okay. This is my other machine. So we do have here two applications. Applications are, and again, if you're a developer, you're going to love it because it's ugly and disgusting. Verifier 1. Verifier 1 is an application that was coded a long time by a happy developer, which means it cannot connect to SQL when you double click on it. Hmm, let's check it out. So I do have, this is, this is it, by the way. So this is my application. As you see, very uh, rich. <laughs> Verify SQL connection. And then you see SQL server is dead. Did it happen to you one day sometime that you wanted to connect to SQL server, but at some point you see that, uh, sorry, connection failed? And even if you sniff it, you cannot see it, and so on. So we're like, mm -hmm. the password must be hard-coded. Oops, I feel this like somebody is stopping me in the belly. Hard-coded. Uh, uh. This should never happen. Okay, so what do we have in here? So this is my first app. Another app is actually having the same problem. Yes, SQL Server is dead. Well, that's super interesting. So what can we do with this kind of situation? We do have... Everybody knows Process Explorer, right? Process Explorer, it's a tool that Mark Rusinovich wrote, and you can find it in sysinternals.com. Uh, oh, let me enlarge it. Yeah, here we go. So at that point, what I'm going to do, I'm going to run these two apps, Verifier 1 and Verifier 2. Here we go. So they are opened over here. What I need to do, I need to, at that particular situation, check out, maybe, I will find something that is called strings. Strings are strings that are to be found within the application. So whenever you are, for example, analyzing malware, you can also search in strings to maybe search for some information that was useful. My team was responsible for analyzing Stuxnet. We are playing with Stuxnet a lot, and in strings, for example, you can find a couple of interesting words, like what was the project name that developer was using, and this kind of things. So at that point, what we can do, we can browse through strings, and we can search if there is a possibility that we can, for example, find a password that is hard-coded in the application. So here we go. This is a connection string to SQL Server. Another useful thing, whenever we do have an application that is, for example, encrypting password, we need to wait for the application to use it. Eventually, if application is storing the password in a memory, we can make a memory dump for the process and search for the same kind of information. And this is my verifier number two. Let's go to the properties. Strings, can we find the password over here? Let's check out. Unfortunately, strings, it's a pretty long place to jump into, so not everything looks user-friendly. And in that certain scenario, what do we see is that password is encrypted, or at least X. So what can we do in this kind of situation? Well, there is no very, very known, kind of simple, not always administrators-related technique, in which we can make a dump of the process. So here we go. This is this verifier number two. Right click on it and then create a dump file. Yes? That dump file will tell you all the details that are in the memory that are related to the certain application. Whatever runs, it's in the memory. If application is using something, it's going to be in the memory. In what kind of form? Let's see. So create dump file. And again, don't get me wrong, it's not a user-friendly solution. But at least we'll get some information. Okay, so we do have this string over here. Let me copy it. And let me enter the place. Here we go. Um, verifier 2. So this is our dump. Ta-da! I'm sorry for the very unpleasant view. But at that stage, what we can search for, we can search, for example, for some string. I'll search for SQL user because this is the moment in which we do have a connection string called for. 
and we do have a password. So just another place. So lesson learned. A, password might be hard-coded in an application. B, password might be stored in the configuration files of the application, even if you don't want that. C, password may be found if you are doing the troubleshooting in the dump of the process of the certain application. Useful at some point? Yes? Okay. I'm going to leave. <laughs> Perfect. So, this was the introduction. Now, let's switch to the juicy part. Passwords idea and passwords from applications. So where else password is stored? Who knows something that is called SPAW? Put your hands up. One person, two, three, four. Thank you. Whoa, haha, <laughs> that's interesting. What else, what about everybody else? Do you add users to local admin? Okay, let me tell you what SPAW is. Uh, SPAW, it's a pretty cool app that is allowing us to play with uh, something that is called RANAS, normally in operating system, but it's doing it in a little bit different way. This is something that is used by administrators if you want to prevent the situation in which you would like to, or maybe you don't want to, add a user to a local admin. So user is the domain user, but at the same time it's local admin. You don't want that. Local admin can do basically everything. On the yesterday's session, I showed, you, I showed you Windows Credentials Editor. If the user is local admin, and if you log into the workstation, user has your password, because user is local admin. User is able to dump it. Okay, so what do we have in here? Oh, hmm, whenever we are using SPAW, what we are doing, we are actually taking the, the, the administrator's password, and we are encrypting it, into some file that is called a job file. And this particular job file contains a username and password in the encrypted way. So at that point, let me show you how SPAW works. So I'm gonna jump to my server, and I'm gonna open up CMD. So let me move myself to the folder in which I do have all applications. Spow, tool, and tool, and there. So at that point, I do have here Spow, as you see, and I got um, Spooler, Spooler.cmd. Spooler.cmd contains the job, I will, I will show this in a moment, that allows a user to restart a Spooler. How many times you were in the need to restart for a user a Spooler? It's a simple service, yes? User is not allowed to, user is not able to print. Maybe we need to do the spooler research. So there are two options. Either user is going to be in the local admins group. You can assign as well permissions to the service, but this is kind of maybe not sophisticated, but still possible. Or you can create a job that's going to do the job for you. So at some point, let me jump to a tech example. And let me show you what we're going to do. So over here, the command, sorry, the command looks like that. So we do run SPAW using domain admin or whoever that has permissions to do something. And then we are starting and stopping spooler. So this is the first thing. This creates us a job. So let me show you how it works. First of all, I'm going to copy that. And I'm going to run it, paste like a regular task, so that you see how Spooler works. Here we go. Spooler is stopping, starting, service uh, is at that point uh, restarted successfully. So if you want your user to do it, what we can do, we can, at some point, let me uh, do the, uh, like that, uh, run as a different user, authenticate as user 01. Here we go. As you see, I'm user 01, and I'm going to do the same operation, but from the user perspective. So user, net stop spooler, is not allowed to do it. Access is denied. But as long as we will do this through SPAW, we are able to do that. So first of all, the background. Over here, I do have this spooler.cmd. 
this is the script that user just needs to double click on the desktop and then things going to happen. Okay, so let me move to uh, passwords. Perfect. Let me move to spow. Let me move to a tool. And then I'm going to run spooler.cmd. As you see, user is allowed to do it. So this is how, sp this is how spow works, yes? Interesting thing, but I've done it by purpose using the key switch. You see that the task is executed as administrator. Yes, so we understand how it works? Perfect. At some point, we need to figure out where the password is stored then, because user can do stuff that user cannot normally do. Okay. So there are a couple of words to getting out passwords. Waiting for the application to react, password to go out, and the password to be internally used. So if you think for the, for the moment, what kind of mechanism can we touch to grab the password? Well, at some point, we can take all this encryption mechanism that SPAW is using and do the same things over and over again. Yes? This is kind of boring. On the other hand, what we can imagine, because this is what we need to do, is like whenever, for example, you are using POP3, that's something that uses clear text, yes? So you got your mail client. How do you want to recover your password? How do you want to recover your password using POP3? Sniff it. Thank you. So this is what we need to do. But we are not using any kind of network connection. So we need to sniff it using internal mechanisms of operating system, connect to the certain application, and wait for it. So sniff it, but not using a network. OK, guys. If you want another reference, this is the same situation whenever you would like to do the money withdrawal. So you go with your cart. And then you were like, okay, I would like to do the money withdrawal. There are a couple of ways to steal the money from this guy. Yes, I'm from Poland, so a couple of things are happening. Yes? It's, it won't be a Polish habit what I'm going to tell you. <coughs> Maybe some other habit. I don't know. I never heard about it. Okay, so you can steal the guy's pin and say, hey, man, give me my pin. My pin. <laughs> it's not right now my pin. And he's like, okay, this is the pin. But there are also better ways to do it, yes? What you can do, you can wait for the guy to do the money withdrawal, and then you're going to leave. I need to take the money and you walk away. Easy? You don't need any PIN. You don't want to use any credit card and so on. You, you, you want the money. This is what you need. And the same stuff we're going to do in SPAW. OK, perfect. So small explanation. And this is why we need a coffee because we need some theory underneath. So we do have an application. This is SPAW. Whenever you run it, it takes, it loads the job file that contains the encrypted user's password and it loads it to the memory with some specific parameters. So as you see, we do have blah, 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 password, domain, username. Yes, so we load that information to the stack. Then, whenever SPAW would like to do this stuff for you, it needs to call an API function that is called create process with logon. And that certain function, it's super juicy in operating system because it's used every time you need to run something as somebody. And what is positive? It takes the username and clear text password as a parameter. Eight. So what do we need to do? We need to establish a trap and listen to, are you going to use a password? Oh, oh this, is what you, this is what you would like to use. Ah, and then when application uses it, it puts it to the stack. So this is pop that we have. And it uses and restarts the spooler service. And then we do have a regular return. So this is this piece of theory that we have. OK, now the demo. Getting passwords right now. Perfect. So let me switch to the server one more time. So here we go. Let me close that. And uh, what I would like to show you, bam. so we do have our prompt. What I would like to show you, it's SPAW decryptor. You can find it in the tools that I shared with you in the morning, at the beginning, yes? Use it. If you're using SPAW, if you're using jobs, or if you find jobs somewhere, don't leave them, don't delete them. Verify what is inside. Maybe you will get somebody's password. So. At that point, I will need to do, use the job file that was created by SPAW. 
So it's file the crypto spooler job. But before I click enter, I would like to show you one thing so that you, I will pretend to you that I'm not lying to you with this piece of theory and I'm for that I'm gonna use Protoss Explorer. Oh, maybe not help. I don't need any help. What kind of suggestion is that? <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, so here we go. Let me make it a little bit bigger. Perfect. So, it's file decryptor in the bottom. Bam. So this is the moment that we are actually using it. So as you see, we do have a command prompt uh, running and we run spout the crypto here. As you see, I do have the domain administrator's password here. If at some point you would like to use what is called in the background, we are creating a trap. So one more time, uh, here we go, we catch the moment. We do have here this CDB that we've got. It's a Windows debugger that we are invoking. We are calling Tspow. We are waiting for application to use the password and we're like, ha ha ha. This is the password. The application is working. Yes? Microsoft doesn't like it. So that's why they are producing this voice, I think. Okay, another example. If you find the job file from other operating system, I just got it from my customer. I mean, you will never recall. <laughs> you will never recall what kind of customer is that. <coughs> uh, but <laughs> on the other hand, you see that it works on every job file. So be careful. I'm not saying SPAW is bad, but be aware what are the, what are the disadvantages. Okay, guys. At that point, we are switching to operating system. So in operating system, Whenever we are thinking passwords, we are thinking obvious stuff. NTDS or DIT, SUM, and so on. But do we really store passwords over there? Not at all. We don't store passwords in NTDS or DIT, either in a SUM database. We don't. Because what we do, we store, it's actually a hash of the password. Yes? So, what is the mitigation if you would like to prevent when somebody grabs your hashes, uh, to prevent the situation when somebody gets your password? Obviously, as I mentioned in the beginning, use just a long password. That is very hard to com compute. That is very hard to guess. So that nobody ever calculated a hash for it. This is the only mitigation plan that we have. Okay, guys. So at that point, we have a small demo in which we are playing with passwords. So let me jump to my domain controller in that point. And let me make, so okay, let me make an offline dump of ntds.dit plus a couple of registry hives so that you can take all the stuff away and work on the ntds.dit using the offline mode. So all the situations that are related with volume shadow copies, snapshots, uh, backups of the domain controllers, and so on, this is the situation in which you can work on whatever is inside. Okay, guys, so at that point, let me jump to my C drive, CMD. I will run it as an admin. Okay, see, so here we go. And over there, I do have a script that is called VSS own VBS. You can download this from the internet. It's to make very quickly a shadow copy, yes? So what I will do first, start VSS own VBS, and I'm gonna just warm it up. So it's ready to go. I do have a service that is ready to go. Perfect. So, next thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to create snapshot. And we do have attempt to create a shadow copy. Okay, so the next thing that I will do, I will do VSS admin list shadows, shadows, and then I will find out what kind of shadow copies do we have? This version five was created right now. So I do have some path over here. That path is used to grab access to the registry that were shadow copied and to the NTDS.dit that was shadow copied. 
So if you are wondering, like, ooh, is it, is it possible to use some PW dump and all the malware tools that you can find in the internet to do the dump of some database, either entities, or just skip it. This is something that can be done with the regular operating system mechanism. Thank you, Microsoft. Okay. So, what, do, what, what can we do at that point? So, we need to do copy, and then we need to put paste. The path that we have to the shadow copy, and then we need to specify the path in which the ntds.dit is stored. So Windows, and then system, uh, sorry, ntds, in this case it's going to be ntds, ntds.dit. So we make a copy, and we copy ntds.dit to the C drive. Bam. Here we go. This is it. The next thing. We need to do the same operation, but we're going to copy the registry highs that are necessary to work on ntds.dit offline. So if you are hacking somewhere, don't use PW dump. Use your regular script. Make a, make a shadow copy. It depends what kind of, obviously, uh, privileges you've got. And grab all the stuff. Leave the place. And do this in your own room. Okay. So... Windows, and then we have System32, config, and then we need to specify as well, and again, System Hive. Here we go. Next is going to be SUM. Here we go. Next is going to be security. Here we go. Created. So we've got all the stuff that we need. Perfect. The next thing that I will do, I'm going to use the library that you can find in Google. <laughs> uh, really, unfortunately. And uh, this library, it has a hard to pronounce name. So let me actually show this to you so that you can download that. Here we go. This is the library. And I'm going to use that using SCEDB export to export tables from ntds.dit so that I'm able to uh, listen to what was in the database using the offline mode. Okay, so at that point, I'm going to use that tool, and I'm going to run it on ntds.dit. And it's exporting the tables. So it contains hashes. It contains all the information that I would like to use that is in the ntds.dit. You got a tool online. Use it. Have fun. Okay, guys. So the next part that we will need to do it's actually not the easiest way because we need to find a tool that's going to take all the tables that we've got, take all the useful stuff, and present it in the eTable form. So at that stage, what we need to do, we need to run Python script. And this is the Python script that was used by a colleague of mine that is called Saba Barta. He's a Hungarian, so he's playing with all the security issues. I posted the link at the beginning. He wrote the tool for offline analysis of NTDS.dit. He's actually working in a forensics uh, environment. Okay, so for that, I'm going to use that particular tool, and I do have it in NTDS uh, X, and the tool is called dsusers.python, yes, so PE. And I need to work on that database over here, because all the tables, actually let me show you this, were exported to the bunch of files that are basically in just a folder on the C drive. So here we go. What we care about is this, and we also care about this. This information, when we combine them together, is going to extract the hashes from ntds.dit. Okay, so here we go. We need to specify that folder, so ntds.dit export, and then we need to connect to the data table, and as the, another parameter, we need to do the same operation. So ntds.export, and then we need to connect to the link table. Here we go. Uh, next thing is the parameter, and we need to specify password, hashes. Why like that? Hashes. Uh, because Sabah decided to make this parameter, yes? So it could be called Winnie the Pooh, and we could use it in the same way. Okay, so here we go, and then we need to specify the system hive that is already there. So, yeah, and then 
maybe we would like to export all the stuff to hash tehet.txt. So we do have all the export going on, scanning database. So if you would like to extract all the information, it takes a moment. So we do have dumping schema and so on. So we've g we basically get everything from that. And uh, hashes tehet, hash tehet that we've got, contains all the information starting from user seat, obviously, ending up with hash of every account that you've got in Active Directory. Small forensics. Ooh, I got like a red cheeks right now. Interesting for now? Yes? Okay, so let me show you one another thing. Whenever we are discussing passwords, uh, there are a couple of things we should take into consideration. So we exported these hashes. But does it really mean that the hash is the only place and only way how we are managing the user's password? We're just comparing against some database, and that's it. Not at all. So there is a mechanism that is called password filter. And password filter, in the registry, it's stored as a notification package. So quick review, reg edit. We are right now in the following place. Local machine, system, control set, control LSA. This stuff here, notification package, I was discussing this two years ago on TechEd. So just a reminder to show you how it works without doing the deep dive into a DLL of, or, on itself. Uh, P stands for Pula, SPI stands for you know what, 64 stands for 64, not bits. So did you think it's 64? Hmm. <laughs> All these namings. Okay, so how does it work? because I have injected it in here as a notification package. The DLL that is called SCECLI is responsible for checking if your password is complex enough. So if you do put characters, numbers, and so on, how do we know it if not on the clear text? We're not checking the hash, yes? We're checking the clear text. So let me show you how it works. Let me rename this file here, because this is my remain that I would like to show you in a moment pull up PWD on the C drive. I'm going to jump to Active Directory Users and Computers. And at that certain stage, what I will do, I'm going to change the password for the test account. So reset password. And I'm going to specify password hash123 exclamation mark. Hash123 exclamation mark. And that's it. Is, was this password complex enough? Yeah. Perfect. So at that point, we do have another pool of PWD with the password in the clear text. Just another mechanism, just in another place, yes? If you want, I've got a DLL that is sending out stuff over the network as well, but that's afterwards, yes? I mean, come, and I can send it to you if you want. But it's illegal and not ethical. Who cares? <laughs> okay. Okay, guys. So the next thing that we have to discuss is actually related to memory dumps. It's super surprising how many times I see in the different kinds of forums that people actually tend to share memory dumps. Hey, please help me. I don't know what to do on the World of Warcraft forum. Oh, no problem. Just share me the memory dump and I'm going to tell you. Oh, really? No, please don't do it. Because in memory dump, what do we have? We have all the information that we don't want to share, like for example, our hash, might be our password, might be LSA secret, might be whatever, because it's a memory. Whatever runs, whatever provides somebody information is going to be in the memory. So at that point, I would like to show you a simple analysis of the memory dump. Quick think, maybe that's something that could inspire you to maybe stop doing this or maybe start doing this and play with the memory dumps a little bit. Okay, guys. So, at that certain point, I will need to jump to my machine. I got a lot of demos today for you. And we need to, let me close that, maybe, open up CMD again. Perfect. And I'm going to move myself to volatility. Um, oh, sorry. CD. Volatility. Vola, vola, vola. Yep. 
Okay, we got everything that we need here. Perfect. So in the volatility, this is the memory analysis tool. We can do a couple of things. First of all, we need to run volatility in Python because again, this is a script that is written in Python. Then we need to run the script. Then we need to specify the file. Where is the dump? So my dump in that certain scenario is actually stored in, let me connect to the device, Think. And I do have this device, the, the dump on the D drive. So I will specify D drive that I connected to. And then I do have Win7 x86 full memory dump. And then I will need to specify a profile. And profile for the scanning of, of the certain patterns in the memory dump is going to be Win7. And then I need to specify service pack one because uh, every service pack provides a patterns. So we need to know how to search in a certain places. And then this is actually E86 because it was done on the 32 bit operating system. And at that point, I need to specify to list a hives because otherwise I will not able to be connect anywhere. So hive list, it takes a moment, unfortunately. But at that point, we're doing the scanning and verifying where in the virtual memory we can find registry hives. And at some point, we will get this information. It's actually a pretty small dump, so it takes a moment. OK, so here we go. We can, at this moment, interrupt that. So what do we have in here? We do have here the address where the system hive in the memory is stored. And we do have also the address where some is in memory stored. So what we can do, we can do the same operation, but change the script to hash dump. And then we can specify that system is under this place over here. So bum paste. And sum is in this place over here. Perfect. Bum paste. Now we can do the scanning. And at some point, hopefully, we'll be able to get the hash dumps. Uh, let me see what is the problem. Python, we do have this like that. Not, not working. Oh, this is really interesting. Actually, it was working before the session because I checked it out. So maybe there's something wrong with my addresses. Let me check. We do have 008 and we've got some. Everything works correctly. Interesting. Uh, OK, so let me show you some mitigation plan for that. What are we going to see? We're going to see the following, the following place, so the following thing. Uh, I actually do have it exported in a notepad, so it doesn't really matter. Bam, bam. And we should see something like that. So at some point, you will be able to get the hashes from the registry uh, using a simple, a simple command. And then you can take it and you can work on the hashes itself for analysis. Sometimes it happens. It's just a memory dump. So happens. OK. The next thing that I have for you is actually related to getting passwords online, but not through the memory, but using something that we call LSA injection. So LSA injection. For LSA injection, I'm going to use a tool that is called Mimikatz. And I'm super proud to use it because my team is helping Benjamin, who is the author of Mimikatz, to develop it a little bit. So you can find it for free to be downloaded from the internet. And at that certain point, let me jump to my machine. So we do have server here. Mm -hmm. And let me connect to the Mimikatz. So I do have my Mimikatz in here, in CD, Mimi. And uh, over there, I do have a couple of versions of Mimikatz. For example, one of the versions is an alpha version. But I'm going to just go to x64, and I'm going to use the regular Mimikatz version. So Mimikatz requires a debug privilege to do anything that is related to injecting a DLL into local security authority subsystem.exe. Why do we need to do it? Because the architecture of the operating system consists of, 
couple of secrets. These secrets are called LSA secrets that we're going to connect to. Local security authority needs to know the secret to be able to use it, to use it, to use it somewhere else, for example. And the only way how we can get inside is to ask LSA, hey, can you pass all the secrets to me? Do you remember Blaster in Windows XP? 30 seconds to shut down. So this is what is happening whenever you try to connect to LSASS.exe without having a debug privilege. But if you get it, LSA is super happy to talk. Okay, so what I will do, first of all, I'm gonna grab myself a debug privilege. Privilege debug. And then what I'm going to do, inject, process, and then LSASS.exe, and then I'm going to inject a DLL that is called securelsa.dll. And then I'm waiting to connect to the client. And now, what we can do, LSA, logon, passwords, logon, passwords. And list all the passwords that are stored currently in the memory, whatever they are. Let's check it out. Okay. So, not everything is super nice and clear, but we're able to browse some patterns that are meaningful for us. I'm Logonas administrator. If you want to get the clear text password, here we go. If anybody else logs into the same workstation, you got that password as well. So this is very nice. And excuse me, old woman, there's more guys here. If you're discussing a couple of things with your wife, and your wife wants to do a shopping, and it's like, hey, honey, can I use your uh, business laptop? And you're like, oh, after my dead body, no. Yes? Uh, and then what you're doing is like, but I can uh, create a profile for you. And then you have your privacy. You're gonna use your own account. I'm not gonna look when you're gonna type your password, not at all. And she does the shopping, you're happy, she's happy. And then you say, can you lock your desktop, please? Okay, thank you. I, I'm just to make sure you lock it. I don't want to see what you did over there. Just do your thing. And then you log into your profile. And then you do Mimi cuts. And then you see like, ooh, he's so cute, or something like that. Yeah, you never know. I wish you all the best. <laughs> okay, guys. So, the next thing that we have to discuss is actually related with services. A small, useful thing. The thing is that services, they store configuration in the registry. So whenever you have a service that is running on an account that is not a built-in account, the password remains in the registry. How we are able to grab it? Well, it's also stored in the LSA secrets. So what we already learned is that as long as something is stored in the LSA secret, we are able to take it, yes? Okay, so let me show you what we can do around that particular subject. And I'm gonna jump into my machine, which is gonna be the main controller, uh, because over there, I do have services, let me see, I do have a SQL server running on a certain service, Papa, SQL service, and I would like to grab the password for SQL service account. So this is all the situation in which you see that the password never expires, for example. That brings some problems to the field sometimes. And you are wondering, sorry, <laughs> you are wondering what kind, of, what kind of information is actually over there. Perfect. So at that certain point, what I need to do, I need to uh, jump into uh, my toolkit. So we do have here, um, let me jump in here. Okay, we do have in here a toolkit. So let me uh, connect to it. Uh, Mm -hmm. Okay, and I do have here two tools. One is psexec, so I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna copy this to the C drive. And another one is sapd, and I'm gonna copy that to the C drive as well. So in psex, we do have here psex and sapd. Sapd is our tool that our developer Michael wrote to do these kind of things. So at that certain stage, I need to uh, open up run psexec. Where's my PS exec? PS exec, I do have it, but I cannot really tab it. Oh, this is strange. Okay, so maybe just like that. PS, PS exec, yeah, that's better, this was strange. Okay, so minus S, 
minus i minus d, cmd dot xd. We do have, at that point, a certain console running as a local system. Let me quickly enlarge the font so that everybody can see it. Bam. Who am I? I am a local system. So I'm going to use SAPD on the name of the service that I have here in the back. So this particular service, it's called SQL Server. I'm going to copy it so that I don't have to type it. And at that certain point, being in local system, which is, oh, I think it was a, yes, it's here. I'm going to paste it. And you are able to see the clear text password for every account that is not a building account. So what about the accountant department? Just to remind you, in which we've got these accountant ladies sitting and using our human resources, using some databases. Let's think for the moment on what account that certain database is running. If it's running on your account, excuse me, yes? That's something that's going to be in a clear text password. Useful? Use the tool. You're free to use the tool. Check out. Maybe there are some too simple passwords. OK. The next thing that we've got is actually related to scheduled tasks. So scheduled tasks are actually pretty interesting because they are a little bit more advanced version of SPAW. So in scheduled tasks, whenever we are running something as a user, we are also waiting for the specific password and the username to be used to run the tasks for you. And we are able to, at that certain moment, listen to the moment in which we are actually making a task, calling for the task. So let me show you what we can get out of it. I'm going to switch to the client this time. Here we go, the client environment. And on my C drive, I do have a Mimikatz in here also running. And I do have scheduled task created. So scheduled task. And that certain scheduled task, if we go to the library, it's called test. And it's running on the other identity that is called whatever. This is an account that I got. As long as you've got this situation and you create scheduled tasks for users, we are able to read the password, I'm sorry, that is clearly stored, uh, clearly taken out at the moment we are actually executing it. So let me open up command prompt one more time. Mm -hmm. And let me switch to Mimi. And over there, I'm going to switch to, might be, for example, uh, X64. Mm, or win 32. And then I'm going to call for Mimikatz. It takes a, a moment for it to run. And I'm going to grab myself a debug privilege. And then I'm going to list whatever the password, whatever the account was used for the scheduled task. So first of all, privilege, debug. OK, so we do have some not all privileges reference assigned to the caller. Actually, let me restart the console one more time. Let me do the other thing. Mimi, maybe let's do like that. And then let's run Mimikatz. So here we go. And uh, I'm going to connect to the SMS, SAMSS service. And I'm going to list everything that is actually stored as a scheduled task. This is actually a demo on the request on one person that was a tech at ND, and he asked me to present that. Come on, Mimi Katz, don't do this to Paula. It runs for a moment, yes? OK. So I think we will be back to this, this place, because we don't have time to actually wait for it. Oh, maybe. OK, that's great. So privilege, debug. Mm. This is actually pretty strange. Uh, OK, let me continue and let me check if, I do, if I'm able to do all my stuff. Inject on this point service. S-A-M-S-S. Secure LSA DLL. 
Ah, impossible. Access is denied. Ooh. Uh, okay, I think why I, I think I know why. Sorry. When you are used to work as administrator, that comes like super smoothly. Let's do this one more time. Mimi, and then X64, and then Mimi cats, and then now it's a little bit faster. Ta-da! Perfect. Uh, inject service and SAM. SS secure LSA dot DLL. Mm -hmm. And then we will be able to list it. Okay. Perfect. And then credential so got get credman full. And here we go. Worth waiting. Bam. So whenever you are administrator and you do have all scheduled tasks running, here we go. Okay guys. Next thing, let me show you another story that is related to something that we call an application pool. So we do have a web server. And web server is, running, is having application pool. Application pool, it's a worker process that is running using certain identity, yes? So this identity is actually executing the request making this a very brief explanation. Whenever the user is calling for the website, there are magical things that are happening in the back, and then we are executing the request using a certain account. So is it possible to get a password for the account that is used by an application pool? And of course, yes it is. Let me show you a last pattern that we can play with that is related to getting this certain, certain password. Okay. That's something that we will do on my server. And at some point, what I will, want, would, like to what I would like to show you is that on my server, I do have the image, which is 2012 server connected. I will reboot myself using offline mode. So restart. And I will show you what can we do from being nobody to actually become some specific privileged account in your domain. So I'm booting right now to the 2012 operating system. So this is Windows PE. I'm going to click Next. I'm going to click Repair Your Computer. And I'm going to go to Troubleshoot, Command Prompt. And then what I would like to show you is how to reset a password using an offline mode and how to become an admin without having nothing. So, I'm going to go to File, Load Hive, and then I'm going to go to the place in which we are storing the registry. So it's going to be Windows, as we already know, System32, and then we're going to go to Config, and then I'm going to connect myself to a Software Hive. And then I'm going to do blah, blah, blah. In the Software Hive, I do have Microsoft, Windows NT, so let me go in the a, in a bottom, current version, and then there is something that is called image file execution options. The name stands for itself. You have some image and you need to execute it with options. But I'm going to add over here a very special image, and that image is going to be called Utilman. Utilman.exe. Utilman.exe, these are accessibility settings. In Utilman.exe, I'm going to create a new string value that is called debugger. And I'm going to call it cmd.exe. So now, Utilman.exe is going to be debugged by cmd.exe. It doesn't sound logical at all, but it works in the following way. Let me close that. Let me close that. And let me continue to reboot. So image file execution options are actually useful whenever you would like to execute some applications using some parameters, always, every time the application runs. So you may use it also for other purposes. But in our special case, we're going to replace utilman.exe with the cmd.exe using the debugging features that we configured. You see this miserable accessibility settings over here? 
These are the accessibility settings. We can access the operating system. What we can do more, let me enlarge it. Unfortunately, it's always like that. Bam, bam. Anti-authority system. Net, local group. Administrators. Here we go. What do we have? Administrator. What we can do? Net user, administrator, password. Here we go. Can we log in? Yes, we can. So let me log in. I'm going to switch user, and I'm going to log in as other user, which is going to be administrator with my password. Boom. The next thing. Oh, we are not over. This is just the beginning. OK. Uh, what can we do right now? Can we become a domain admin? Maybe we can. How to become a domain admin? Mm, maybe we could find out something that runs on a certain account and then grab the password for that place, for that account. What kind of things we may see? So let me see what do we have. We do have IIS running here, mm, application pools. So at that certain stage, what we can jump to, we can search for maybe there is something within the web config file that we can use as a connection string to the SQL server. But uh -huh, we see that this is actually encrypted. So there's not much we can see. OK, are we able to decrypt it? Yes, as long as you get the password of the account that can decrypt it. So who can do it? Application pools identity. So at that point, what we need to jump to is actually Windows, System32, INET server, bam, 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 which is here, config, and then we do have here application host config file. If you open it, we can search for the password of application pool identity. Ooh, but that's something that is encrypted as well. And to be sincere, it's a joke. It's a joke, the best joke in Windows you can see. <laughs> Some people who love their geeks. <laughs> what we can do at that point? So, first of all, let me move to one place. And that place is going to be, in this certain point, uh, up CMD. So, Windows System32. And then we need to go to INET server to, uh, okay, to be able to run appcmd.exe. And appcmd.exe allows us to list up pool settings, whatever they got, whatever they are. What we care about is going to be application pool number one. So it's called application pool one. And we need to list settings for application pool one, and then we need to export that settings to the console text, and we would like to have whatever, <laughs> bum, whatever. So we got some settings over here. What can we read out of that? Let me see, because it's like not a user-friendly text at all, but we are able, wait a moment, da, 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 list the password over here. <laughs> and so on and so on. Okay, not over. Next. We got that account. What we can do? So we do have secure app one and the password. What we can jump to right now is that on that certain machine, on the C drive, I do have PS exec. We can use PS exec to run cmd.exe uh, on, so PS exec, these are the options and we've got here the possibility to run it as user with the password, to run the CMD as an application pool. So we can use PS exec, and then we can specify the user, and the user is going to be secure app one, and we can specify the P and the password, and then cmd.exe. Okay, who am I? As you see, I am app one. So at that certain stage, what we are able to do, so let me enlarge it again. What we are able to do, 
we are able to jump into that certain web config file and maybe decrypt it. Okay, so let's do it. So in this particular moment, I need to go to the tools that are not that obvious, and they're in CD, and in this case, it's gonna be Windows, Microsoft.NET, Framework, and then I need to specify the version of the framework. One, two, three, four, bam. And over there, we've got a very useful tool to encrypt IIS settings, which is called ASP.NET underscore reg IIS. I mean, you will guess it from the first time you see it, obviously. <laughs> but this tool, it's used to encrypt settings in web config files. So if you don't want anybody to see the clear text connection string, here we go. And this is what I applied at first. So I need to run that, and I need to specify parameters. PDF is going to be to decrypt the web config. I need to specify what sections I would like to decrypt. Well, in this case, it's going to be connection strings. Perfect. Where in C, inetpub, root in the place where my application one is. So we are waiting for that. Succeeded. Da, da, da. So we are going to inetpub, root application one, opening up the same web config with notepad, reloaded, yes. And here we go, the clear text password to the SQL server. Got it? What's next? Run us, of course. SQL Server, run us. So, we've got SQL1 and password password. So, let's do the following. Over here in the machine, we've got a SQL Server Management Studio. Run us a different user. And then we are specifying SQL1 and the password. Great. So we're waiting for SQL Studio to launch. And the next thing that we are doing, we are verifying who we are. So let me click Connect. Do you remember on what account the SQL Server was running? I showed you the password of it. SQL Service, yes? We can check out who is particularly this account, who is this account, what is this account doing? So for that, I'm gonna build up a new query and I'm gonna use a stored procedure that is called XPCMD shell. I can enable it if I want to. So XPCMD shell and at some point, I can verify who am I slash O, and let's execute it. So at that certain point, we do have all the information about who we are. And if the database administrator was a bit too happy, we already own the whole domain. You see the pattern? It was pretty long, but as long as we know, where the passwords are stored, we can get to that point. Interesting? You're like, ooh. <laughs> okay, guys, let's run to the end. What we discussed today were actually passwords for everything that is related to application. We played with SPAW, we played with how to use it, how to decrypt it. I showed you also a couple of things that are used and are stored in the memory. I showed you how to grab a password from the application that is suffering from the happy developers that hard coded the password in the app in two ways, using the strings and using the dumps. I also showed you a couple of mechanisms that you can use and I hopefully you will find them useful to grab the passwords from the operating systems. Notification packages, Mimikatz, LSA secrets, services, grabbing passwords from application pools, grabbing passwords from web config files that was encrypted, resetting to yourself a password whenever you do have an offline access. You and more, there are so many places. So every time we are entering the password, we need to think twice if this password is encrypted. How? If we do have a choice, verify it. Next time you're gonna see the password field, and this is my big request for you. Next time you're gonna see the password field. Think for the moment, 
where that password goes. How is it stored? Are we able to sniff it? Sniff it. Are we able to list it? What kind of permissions you need to have to get access to this password? So, conclusion that comes out of that regarding hashes and so on is that use a long password. And I was like, use the long password. <sighs> That's so boring. But it's actually kind of true because it influences how long does it take to basically crack your password. Hope you enjoy it in the morning. I hope the coffee did the job and enjoy the rest of the day. If you do have some questions, let me know. Please fill out the evaluations. Please download the tools. Please use them. If you've got some questions, send me an email. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.